All right, here we are, uh, lesson two in our series, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians, Elders, Ministers, and Deacons. We've already done uh, one lesson on effective, uh, highly effective Christians. Today we're going to be talking about highly effective ministers and elders, and of course then we'll conclude with highly effective deacons. Now as I mentioned in, in the first uh, session, this uh, series or the title of this series is based on a book by Stephen Covey, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And let me tell you a little bit about this book if you've not read it before. Uh, in his book, Mr. Covey reviewed 200 years of success type literature. You know, uh, uh, motivational books and so on and so forth, uh, stretching back uh, two centuries. And uh, he found that regardless of the age or the culture or the profession, effective and thus successful people shared common traits of character. And what he did is he reduced, he distilled all these down to seven, seven basic characteristics of successful and effective people uh, for the purpose of his book. Well, I, I've used the same approach here using the Bible and my experience in church work over the years to identify the seven most common characteristics of effective Christians. So in this session, as I mentioned, we're going to continue this series by listing the seven habits of effective preachers and elders. So we begin, we begin with uh, the habits of effective preachers. Uh, there are many, there are many, but uh, I'm going to name only three, three very important ones. Now I need to repeat that what we're searching to do for all, for Christians, deacons, elders, ministers here, is to describe those common habits that make these people effective. As I've said, there are many who call themselves Christians, many who have been appointed as deacons and, and elders, many who have been commended to the ministry of preaching, but are not very effective in these roles. For example, uh, if just wearing the title preacher made one effective, then you know, any church could randomly you know, select any old preacher to serve them as minister. But you know, we know that churches don't do this because they know from experience that not all preachers are equally effective and some are, are not effective at all. They're just not good at their jobs, just like any other uh, area of, of, uh, of work. And so in our lesson today, we're going to define the habits that effective preachers and effective elders have and have cultivated in order to become successful at what they do. Now as far as preachers are concerned, there are three main habits or characteristics that identify the truly effective minister. These are described by Paul in his letter to a young evangelist named Timothy uh, in 2 Timothy. And so let's start with habit number one. Effective preachers have the habit of purifying themselves. Highly effective preachers have the habit of purifying themselves. Let's read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, shall we? Paul says, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my the laying on of my hands. Now Timothy, uh, to give you just a little bit of background here about why Paul is writing this and why he's saying this in this particular letter, Timothy, it seems, was holding back in his ministry because of his youth, because of the many distractions in the world, because of the fear of persecution by the Jews and certainly persecution by the Romans uh, at this period of time in history. And so Paul encourages him to renew his gift, to purify himself continually by separating himself from those things that would hinder or distract or would slow him down in his ministers. You know, even preachers get into a rut. You know, it could be a rut of fatigue or a rut of boredom or a rut of laziness or sinfulness. Uh, it's usually a rut where the preacher starts majoring in minors in order to avoid the true and the hard work of ministry. Now, effective preachers have the habit of purifying themselves on an ongoing basis 
in order to remain fresh and open and sensitive to the Spirit's lead. Effective preachers cultivate spiritual habits that serve to purify their minds and hearts continually. For example, they read the Bible continually. It's not something they only do when they're preaching, it's a habit that they have on a daily basis. They, they make time for personal prayer. You know, it's interesting to note that a lot of preachers, you know, they're, they're in situations where there's prayer going on, you know, an opening prayer, a closing prayer, they pray for somebody else, but a lot of times preachers don't take the time to pray themselves. A, a, a personal quiet time for just themselves and the Lord. Effective preachers have a powerful and consistent prayer life on a daily basis. They also read and study material that will expand their minds and their ministry. Of course, you have to read the Bible, but in addition to that, effective preachers also read other material to open up their ideas about certain issues, to give them a better insight into church work and so on and so forth. They also cultivate relationships that keep them accountable. You know, one way to purify yourself is to have a friend, a brother uh, uh, in, the, in the Lord, someone in the church who's able to, to tell you when you're wrong, to tell you when you're putting the wrong emphasis. You know, your, uh, preachers usually count on their wives to, to do that for them, but you also need a, what I call an accountability uh, relationship with a brother uh, in the Lord. They are also involved in activities that serve the brotherhood in general and not just the local church. And they do this to expand their view of the kingdom. You know, if, uh, the only people the preacher ever sees are people in his own congregation. He doesn't know what's going on in his city, in his, in his state, in the country. You, you need to kind of expand your mind and expand your view to see what's going on in the brotherhood to have a, a, a better grasp of things. Effective preachers understand the trends and things that are taking place in the brotherhood. And they also do what's difficult first. Oh, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Effective ministers know that it's important to do the hard stuff first. You know, I once knew a preacher who hated to study and prepare lessons, but he did love computer work and office things. So he would spend, you know, during his week, he'd spend three days getting the bulletin ready and preparing mission reports with statistic sheets and pie charts and graphs. And he'd run errands and he'd do the office work and the accounting and all this and that. And then finally on Saturday night, you know, when he just couldn't put it off anymore, he'd get down and, and get his lessons together for the next day. And you know what? By the time Sunday rolled around, you knew that he was just getting his stuff ready at the last minute. It would show. And so effective preachers continually purify themselves and their ministries in order to maintain the enthusiasm and the passion that characterized their original call into ministry. All right, uh, highly effective ministers also, also preach. In other words, effective preachers preach. Let's go to 2 Timothy, we're still in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and let's read verses 8 to 12. It says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, His prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus for all eternity but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and, immort uh, and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. You know, Paul, in this passage here, is still passionate about the gospel, even when he refers to it in a letter to a fellow believer and a fellow worker. Even though Paul has suffered for the gospel, he is still completely convinced and fully engaged in the spread of the good news. In other words, nothing's stopping him. 
Uh, effective preachers are effective because they're excited by the message. They're not excited about where they're going to preach the message or how many people will be there. Paul is zealous in this letter and yet he's only writing to one person. And so what makes preachers effective is that they want to preach. They need to preach. Uh, they need to preach in season or out of season, whether it's a big crowd or a small crowd, whether the hearers are friendly or skeptical, whether it's local or international or in person, whether they're preaching on television or radio, in print, on the internet, they just want to preach. So effective preachers are convinced that the gospel is God's truth to man and they are anxious, even uncomfortable, if they don't get to preach. Effective preachers have to preach. Habit number three, highly effective preachers persevere. Highly effective preachers persevere. You know, when I say persevere, I mean that preachers who succeed in ministry are those who are able to you know, keep keep on keeping on, uh, they're able to last, they're able to hang in there, they have a persevering spirit. In his letter to Timothy, Paul encourages Timothy to persevere in three areas. First of all, to persevere in doctrine. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, this time in verse 13, he says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. And then in chapter two, verses one and two, he says the following, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so, uh, uh, effective preachers are able to persevere. Persevering uh, uh, in a doctrine or a teaching means to continue diligently teaching God's word even when it's inconvenient or when people will not listen or when people will not obey. Persevering even when others oppose uh, within the church and without and not being able uh, or not being afraid rather to confront persevering in the effort to train others in the word and in the teaching of it. You know, the preacher's job is to minister the word in every circumstance and successful, effective preachers make sure that they don't get away from that primary task in their many-sided uh, many job. It's easy to lose focus. You know, it's easy for preachers to kind of lose focus and, 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 and stop preaching the word. And that brings me to the second area of perseverance, and that's persevering in ministry. Effective preachers persevere in preaching the word, and they persevere in ministry. Let's stay in 2 Timothy. This time go to chapter 2, verse 3, begin in verse 3. Paul says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not in prison. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. A kind of a long passage there where Paul is talking about the importance of persevering in ministry. In other words, there are many distractions and temptations in the world and ministers need to be careful not to be trapped in these. 
You know, some, some ministries are ruined by worry or sinfulness because the preacher becomes more involved with something other than ministry on the side. And, and eventually this thing leads to ruin. Successful, effective preachers keep their eye on the prize and their hands on the wheel of ministry without making any detours. You know, on a personal note, throughout my ministry career, I've been offered all kinds of partnerships and different ventures, but I always refuse because it would be a distraction. I, 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 want, I, I don't want to be concerned about anything other than my family and my ministry. I do not want to be distracted uh, from preaching the gospel and ministering, from, uh, ministering uh, to the church. All right, so uh, persevering in preaching the word, persevering in ministry, and, and the effective preacher, highly effective preacher, also knows how to persevere in the love of the church. You know, there are many more comments by Paul to Timothy in both his letters about being a good preacher, enough to fill out you know, this entire lesson and a couple of others. Suffice to say that the most effective preachers that I've ever met uh, and seen work are those who actually love the Lord's church. You understand what I'm saying? Not just, well, they're good speakers and so they want to speak, but they actually love the people. They love Christians. They love the Lord's church. You know, no matter how they are treated, whether they have preached in a big or a small church, whether they've been in the Bible Belt or in the mission field, effective preachers continue to love the Lord's church and sacrifice themselves for it. You know, no matter how much education you have or how skilled a speaker you are, if you do not love the church, you cannot be effective as a minister. You know, people can sense this and they'll respond to you accordingly. And so effective preachers, those who are effective in the work, are those who love the church and persevere in loving the church despite the things that happen. All right? So let's summarize here. There are a lot of people who wear the name minister or preacher. I mean, colleges and preacher training schools are producing a new crop every year. But effective preachers achieve success because they have cultivated three important habits. Number one, they continually purify themselves through prayer and the cleansing word of God. Number two, they continually preach the gospel with enthusiasm and avoid debates over issues and personalities. And three, they continually persevere in teaching the word to others, serving others, and promoting the church of Christ to the world. This is what they're about. This is what is central about them. You know, let's face it, if the only thing that you remember about the preacher is his hobby or his passion for football, you know, if all you remember, oh yeah, Brother Joe, you know, he was a great preacher, yeah, yeah, oh, he loved football. I remember the time at the game we did this and he used to coach the kids. You know, if you don't remember him for his passion for Christ, rather his passion for football, something's wrong there. Of course, there are a lot of other factors that contribute to successful ministry. You know, things like you know, people skills and getting in touch with the culture of the people you're preaching to, so on and so forth. However, the habits that I've just spoken of, uh, a man will not become effective in ministry no matter how many friends he has in the church or how he fits into the local scene if he doesn't cultivate these three basic habits. All right. Let's move on to effective elders. We're going to do both of these in this particular uh, session. Now, uh, it's difficult to say all that needs to be said about the role of elders. So I'm going to have to summarize and compress my comments into four key habits for effective elders. So we had three key habits for the preachers, four key habits for the elders you know, ends up uh, in, uh, in seven. It gives you seven. So let's begin right away, shall we? Habit number one, highly effective elders are on guard. Highly effective elders are on guard. Let's go to Acts, shall we? Switch over, go to Acts chapter 20. Let's read verse 28 uh, to 30. Paul is speaking to elders, uh, his kind of farewell speech to them. And he says to them uh, in, verse 20, uh, in, excuse me, in chapter 20, verse 28, he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock 
among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. I know that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So in this particular passage, Paul calls the elders together and he exhorts them to be on guard, to be on guard. And so effective elders, highly effective elders, first and foremost, the, the habit that they cultivate is that they are on guard. First of all, they're on guard for themselves. Effective elders watch themselves and their conduct and their attitude first and foremost. You know, elders who are not seen as striving to grow and develop in personal spiritual maturity have no respect among the brethren. And without respect, they cannot be effective. They can be the elder, but the, the question is being an effective elder. The church you know, will be patient and forgiving with a man uh, and his weakness if he is striving to improve it. You know, more elders lose their effectiveness because they mistakenly think that being an elder excuses them from having to deal with sinful habits or sinful character traits such as pride or laziness or gossip or, or, or being angry or aggressive or worldly, and that's not so. So uh, uh, elders have to be on guard and the first thing they guard is themselves. Secondly, they guard the flock. Effective elders understand that once they become elders, they have to change their priorities. You know, many times men take on the eldership and they see it as like an extra duty, like a religious hobby that they kind of add to all their other activities. But eldership is much like marriage. It changes your whole life and it changes your schedule. The most effective elders are those that guard the flock 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just on Sunday and on uh, Wednesday. It is not a part-time job, it's a full-time job. You can't be effective as a shepherd without being deeply involved in the lives of the sheep seven days a week. Effective elders on guard also, for them, they guard themselves. They guard the sheep, they guard the word. Note in Paul's encouragement in meeting with them that there was no talk of buildings or money or programs, things like that. These were matters that the deacons were concerned about. We'll talk about that in our next section. Effective elders concerned themselves about their ongoing personal spiritual development. They're concerned about the need and the direction of the spiritual lives of the members and the accurate teaching and preaching of God's word. And so effective eldering requires men who resist the temptation to do the more, you know, the more tangible work that belongs to the deacons and tackle the more challenging and demanding work of building the kingdom within the members. Too many elders you know, regress to being deacons because it's easier to be a deacon instead of going forward and, and doing the shepherding work, which is more difficult. It may not be more difficult physically, but it's more difficult spiritually and emotionally. The word tells us that effective elders accept and excel in guarding themselves, guarding the church, and guarding the word against the world, against the forces of evil and darkness. And so in order to be a highly effective, Elders must first of all be on guard. Habit number two, effective elders are on duty. They're on duty. Now this is a personal observation, but I've noticed that the most successful elders are the ones who carry the shepherd's staff wherever they go. In other words, their lives are defined by their role as elders in the church. You see it in the way they talk, you see it in the way they act, you see it in the way they react to things in or out of the church. Some elders you know, are elders when they're in the building or when they're at an elders meeting, but effective elders are elders at ball games or picnics or work. Wherever they are, no other role, whether it be in their job or their favorite hobby, no other role is more emphatic than their role as elder. In other words, when they share with other people that they serve at el as elders in their church, people are not surprised. You know, if you say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an elder in my church, and people say, really? Man, I would have never guessed that. Well, there's a problem. 
What you want is, oh, well, I thought you're the type of man that would probably you know, serve in that way. So elders who are on duty realize that in this world there are, no, there are so many lost sheep looking for a shepherd and they have been ordained by God to find these lost sheep wherever, wherever they are. And so highly effective elders are on guard, they're on duty. Highly effective elders are also on fire, third habit, they're on fire. Let's go to Acts, uh, shall we? This time let's go back to Acts chapter 13. Read a very important passage there. Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse one. It says, now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now, I read, uh, I read uh, these, to, these passages rather, to point out that the elders, it says they had prophets and teachers, teachers there refers to, to elders, I read this passage to point out that elders were involved in the great mission work of Paul to the Gentiles. Now, you know, we, we read that, we kind of gloss over it because we're in a hurry to read about what Paul was doing. But you have to understand, at that time, it took great courage to encourage and support this type of activity for Jewish Christians. But they were enthusiastic for the gospel and therefore they sent Paul out. This was not a, a, you know, a great popular thing to send somebody out you know, to preach to Gentiles. So it took great courage to do this. So many times elderships you know, are reduced to being just decision-making bodies that give thumbs up or thumbs down for you know, budget items instead, you know, carpet color, that type of thing, instead of being on the leadership edge of launching new ideas and efforts to seek and save the lost and minister to the saints. Elders that are kind of fired up about evangelism or helping the poor or strengthening the church or providing the kind of leadership that people will follow. Effective elders lead by example, all right? but highly effective elders lead by inspiration. And inspiration is what leads the church to do great things for God. These elders, these teachers here in Acts chapter 13, that was inspired leadership to lay hands and to commend Paul to go forward on this mission work that would you know, cause a lot of uh, consternation in the church at the beginning, you know, preaching to the Gentiles, very difficult thing. All right, so effective elders are on guard, they're on duty, they're on fire, and then habit number four, effective elders are on the same track. On the same track. In Ephesians chapter four, verse two, Paul says the following. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So in this passage we see that Paul understood that when you take people who are divided by culture, uh, divided by social position, divided by education, each with their own sinful flesh, when you take people that have all these characteristics and you try to make one unified body out of all these separate parts, you're going to have to work at it. It's not going to be easy to unify people that have these traits. It is no different with elders and their efforts to work together as a unified group. Why do you think that the qualifications for eldership stress those things that enable a man to get along with other men. I mean, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 to 7, we're not going to read it, but there he lists 16 qualifications for an elder candidate. And of these 16, eight qualifications refer to his ability to relate to other people, especially other elders, because these are the men he will spend a lot of time with. 
So what I'm saying is effective elders are those who truly are temperate and prudent and hospitable, not addicted to wine or anything for that matter, not confrontational, not argumentative, not self-willed, you know, my way or the highway type people, not proud, meaning they can admit mistakes, they can apologize when they're wrong. And so effective elders work on their relationship with each other. They invest time and effort into this for many reasons. First of all, causing division and conflict among the elders is always the first plan of attack for Satan. That's why it's so important for elders you know, to be on the same track, to work at uh, the unity that they need to have together in order to provide unified leadership. They're always under attack by Satan. Satan understands if, they, if he can break up the eldership, it's just another step to break up the church. And so effective elders work on this unity idea. Eldering also is a group task, not an individual task. So the more unified and team oriented the eldership is, the more successful they are. And the more successful they are as individual elders. Your success as an elder, your relative success as an elder is based on your relative ability to work with the team, to work with the group. And then finally, the church is a reflection of the eldership. A divided, do-nothing eldership is going to produce the same kind of congregation. So effective elders recognize that a healthy, open, unified group of elders is biblical in nature and a source of comfort and confidence to the congregation. You know, when we were kids, we didn't like to see our parents argue, right? If you saw mom and dad arguing and shouting at each other, it was kind of frightening. It was, it was very discon disconcerting, wasn't it? Well, believe it or not, we don't like to see our elders arguing either. We don't like to see division among our elders. It frightens the congregation. And so effective elders not only know this, but they take concrete steps to maintain that unity of the spirit and they work diligently at keeping the peace among themselves and they do it for the love of Christ and the sheep that he died for and into their hands the Lord has, has, has put a certain responsibility for them. All right, so let's summarize this part. You know, obviously, again, so much more could be said about the very important subject of elders, but these four, these four critical habits will suffice. Effective eldering requires that men be on guard each day for the spiritual well-being of themselves, the church, and the teaching of the word. Effective elders need to be on fire in order to inspire the church with their zeal to serve the Lord and the church and the lost. You know, if elders don't inspire, who's going to inspire us? You, you, you can't subcontract out you know, inspiration. Inspiration has to come from within the congregation. You, you, you can't hire inspiration. And of course, they have to be a force for unity and peace and reconciliation for the leadership as well as for the entire, entire church. And so effective leadership in the church is the first key to growth because the church cannot grow beyond its leadership. All right, well, I hope that you'll continue to pray and support your eldership, you know, whoever is watching this. I, I, I hope that, uh, and those people who are hearing this lesson today, I hope that you'll always support and accept uh, your elders, pray for them, encourage them, uh, help them to be more and more effective as the years go by. All right, so that's session number two, uh, the habits of highly effective preachers, ministers, and the habits of highly effective elders. Our next session, we're going to deal with deacons. And I hope you'll be with us for that. Thank you.